Hi, everybody. It's Robin May, life coach and licensed therapist and the founder of the I Believe in Marriage Network. And today we are talking about sex. Say it with me out loud. I want you to say sex. <laughs> Listen, I say that because I have had an opportunity to teach this session many, many times, normally in person and normally at church events. And it never fails. Whenever I have this conversation or wherever we have this topic, it's almost like adults, like grown-ups, are hesitant or nervous about this topic. So much so, I wish I had it in front of me now. So much so, I normally take a bell. And whenever I ring the bell three times, I have them say, sex, sex, sex. Because listen, we are adults and we should be able to talk about this without whispering, without being nervous, without being shy. So say it with me, sex. Now, I have learned in my work with people, I am really obsessed with human behavior, but I have learned in my work with people that we really seem to be on the extreme. Either we're all the way to the left or we are all the way to the right. So while there are people who are hesitant, who are nervous, who are a little shy about this conversation, there is also the total opposite end. There are people who are crass, who kind of say whatever it is they want to say, that have no discretion. And I don't believe as people of faith, and that's normally who my audience is, that's normally who those of you who are watching now on Facebook Live, that's normally who you are. So as people of faith, there should be some discretion. We should be um, mindful about how we have this conversation. Now, discretion doesn't mean that we're boring. Discretion doesn't mean that we don't take care of business in the bedroom or wherever we are, but that does, that does mean that we should have some class. That does mean that we shouldn't just be crass. And so I don't want us to be on either end of the spectrum. Let's find some balance. But again, I want you to say sex. We are going to talk about sex today. We're going to talk about the difference between want to sex and supposed to sex. We are going to talk about why God even created sex. And I'm going to share with you three things I think every couple needs to know about what hinders their sexual freedom in their bedroom. And then I'm going to end with a couple of um, suggestions for wives and a couple of suggestions for husbands, okay? So as you are joining this, if this conversation is something that you think your audience, your friends, your family, needs to know, will you go ahead and hit share on the video and say, this is must watch Facebook. We're going to talk about sex. But before I dive into this conversation, I wish I had some pom-poms because I would shake them. I'm going to bring some pom-poms next week. I would shake them right now because I'm so excited because we have an upcoming in-person event. It is called the Couples Coffee and Conversation Live. And early bird registration is taking place right now. So click the link that you see right there or go to ibelieveinmarriage.com slash winning team. ibelieveinmarriage.com slash winning team. I am super excited about this in-person event. Listen, people always say things like marriage is so hard. Marriage is difficult. I've said it. Many people say that. And it is hard. But y'all, it shouldn't be that hard. It shouldn't be a job that is not rewarding. It is hard work, but it should be the best work we do in addition to our children. So it doesn't have to be as difficult as we are making it. And I want you to join me in this in-person live event so I can help take some of the pressure off, so I can help you understand how it is hard work, but it is fun work. I want to help you and your spouse build your marriage as a winning team. I want you to take away the guesswork. I want you to know the customized reason why God put you and your spouse together. There was a reason he connected the two of you, I promise. So go to, go to ibelieveinmarriage.com slash winning team. Get on that early bird registration. It goes away June 15th. You don't want to miss this. All right, let's get into our conversation. So I told you we're going to cover a lot. First of all, raise your hand right now if you got married to be celibate. Go ahead, raise your hand. I know I can't see you, but I'm pretty sure that none of you raised your hand. None of us got married to be celibate. And if you did, just, just surprise me, inbox me, let me know. I've never had anybody tell me, Robin, yes, I got married to be celibate. Well, if we did not get married to be celibate, you may be surprised at this statistic. I learned this out. I learned this statistic um, probably 18 years ago. I've been married 16 years. I learned this statistic. It may be 18 years ago. And I remember when I first learned it, I said, what? Oh, that won't be me. They are crazy. I learned that married couples are intimate on average, on average, 64 times a year. 64 times a year. Can I tell you what that boils down to? Once a week, 
maybe on someone's birthday, Valentine's Day, maybe Christmas and your anniversary, once a week and a couple of other times throughout the year. Now, often when I'm in person and I'm teaching this seminar, people will say things like, oh, well, I've heard people, especially if I'm with, um, oh, I was about to say something, but that might be stereotypical, but especially when I am with people who are more mature in age, they often say to me, Robin, I wish we could get to 64 times a week. Here's the deal with a year, sorry. Here's the deal with that statistic. Listen, I don't even want you to get caught up in that number. The bottom line is most people are not as intimate as frequently as they would want to be. So I want to talk about why is that? Why is it that our intimacy is impacted? Now, the reality is we want quality intimacy over quantity. Like we want the quality to um, exceed even the quantity. We want really good sex, right? We just don't want average sex. So I want to talk about how do we get past that average intimacy? Let's talk about what it takes to have really, really exciting intimacy. Okay. So first, again, as I shared with you, primarily my audience is a audience of believers. It's people who want to honor God and they want to follow the Bible. So let's talk for a minute about why God even created sex. Everything God does, he does for a reason. Let me just stop here and say this to you. Even, even your own life, even your children, even the job you're in, everything that God does in your life, he does it for a reason. We serve a God that is a purposeful God. And so that's the same thing when it comes to sex. There was a reason why he created sex. And there were three primary reasons. So let me just throw those out to you really quick. And then we're going to get to the difference between want to sex and supposed to sex. Okay. If you are just logging in, make sure you share this video and tell them this is must watch Facebook. All right. Here is the difference between want to sex. I mean, no, I wasn't going there yet. First, I'm going to tell you the three reasons why God created sex. Number one, he created sex to be a picture, a picture. Let me tell you what I mean. In Ephesians, the Bible tells us that a husband um, leaves his mother and father to be joined with his wife. We've all learned about leaving and cleaving. And the reality is that our marriages were created to be a picture of how God loves the church. And so our marriages are not suppo supposed to be average. We are supposed to be a picture. We are an example. And so what happens with sex, that's how we become one. That is how God creates oneness in marriage. So listen, sex is critical. It's a critical part of your relationship. That is the beauty of two people becoming one. That is the picture for the body of Christ. So he created sex to be a picture. Number two, he created sex, of course, for us to procreate. The Bible says in Genesis, um, be fruitful and multiply. So he created sex for us to procreate, to have chillings. And listen, I have contributed the three that I'm going to contribute. So God, thank you. Three and done. And then the third reason why he created sex. Let me tell you this. I mean, lean in. This is my favorite reason. Are you leaning in? He created sex for pleasure, for pleasure. I hate, remember I said that there are people who are very um, rigid and timid when it comes to sex. And then there are those people who are crass and have no discretion. So I don't wanna be on either end of those spectrums. So I'm just gonna say this, hear me when I say, there are parts of the, are parts of the woman's body that has no purpose other than pleasure. Okay, so God created sex for pleasure as well. So again, everything God does, he does for a reason. So sex is supposed to be a picture of oneness. Two, sex is supposed to help us to allow us to procreate. And three, he created sex for pleasure. So you should be enjoying your sex life. It should not be a chore. It should not be like, oh my God, let me go do this. You're supposed to enjoy this time with your spouse. Let me go back to that 64 times a year. Can I tell you a scarier statistic? Now, I haven't researched this all the way, but I have read the statistic at least three, four, three or four different times from different sources. Listen to this. Married couples are intimate 64 times a year. I've read a statistic that says Christian couples are intimate 55 times a year. That's less than the 64 times a year. And remember, I broke down that the 64 times a year is once a week and a few other times during holidays. So then why is it, if that statistic is true, 
Why is it that people who love God, who profess to be Christians, are not enjoying intimacy in their marriage? Why is it less than other people? Listen, sex is a gift that God gives married couples. Sex is a gift that God gives married couples. And I don't know about you, but my mama taught me, if somebody gives you a gift, you open it and you say thank you. So I want to know, are you and your spouse opening the gift of sex in your marriage? All right. So again, as you're coming on, please share this video. Let other people know that this is must watch Facebook. And I am sharing with you the three. I just shared with you the three reasons why God created sex. Now, many of you Bible scholars out there might be able to give me five or six different reasons, but those three basic reasons are really important for us to remember. But let's keep going because I want to get to the difference between want to sex and supposed to sex. All right. So when I talked about this Facebook Live that I was going to do, I said that there were three things that every husband and wife needed to know. And this is what I'm about to share with you right now. And I really am serious about this. And I want you to take this seriously. I've worked with couples for many, many years. I've worked with individuals for many years. I've been in the field of counseling for over 10 years and coaching for at least five or six. And there are some reasons why there are barriers to sexual freedom. When God created sex, he told us that the marriage bed was undefiled. Remember, my audience is primarily people of faith. And if that is you, the Bible says that the marriage bed is supposed to be undefiled. That means you can be free, boo. You're supposed to have a good time. This is supposed to be enjoyable. This is not supposed to be a burden. This should not be a place of contention. This should be a place of enjoyment. So the question is, if that's the case, then why aren't people free when it comes to sex? And these are the three things I think every husband and wife needs to know. And as I'm sharing these three barriers, I want you to think about yourself first. Our human nature, as we begin to think about our spouse, yeah, that's my spouse's issue. Uh, thank you, Robin. That's exactly what I needed to know about my man. Or that's what my wife's issue is. I don't want you to operate like that. I want you to first self-reflect. So I'm going to share these three barriers. And then once you've thought about yourself, I do want you to be considerate. Is this something your spouse might be dealing with? Maybe there hasn't been a safe space created. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Maybe there hasn't been a safe space created for them to share with you. Or maybe they have shared with you, but they don't even fully understand how it has impacted them. So these are the three barriers to sexual freedom. Number one, again, for my faith-based watchers, sin. Sin is a barrier to sexual freedom. And we could give many, many scenarios of what I mean by sin. But let's just look at um, extramarital affairs. When there has been an extramarital affair, and again, if you believe in God and you follow the word, we know that stepping outside of your marriage is a sin. Well, when you step outside of your marriage, there will create a barrier to sexual freedom. I tell husbands all the time, do you want your wife to swing from the chandeliers? Then she needs to make sure you ain't swinging with nobody else. Do you understand? You want your wife to feel sexually free. What, ladies, because listen, it ain't just the fellas who's stepping out. Ladies, your husband wants to know that you ain't creeping emotionally or physically with anybody else. Sin creates a barrier to sexual freedom, even if it's not a conscious barrier. It's a subconscious barrier because when it's not, hear me, when you are a person of faith and there has been sexual sin or any type of sin and you have no response from that, you have no conviction, it ain't bothering you at all, that's a whole nother issue. So number one, one of the barriers to sexual freedom, this is one of the three things, one of the three things I think every husband and wife needs to know. The barriers to sexual freedom starts, number one, with sin. Number two, this is really important and this is really sensitive, shame. Many times, people who have experienced some type of molestation, if there has been any other abuse, if there has been any reckless behavior in their, in their maybe in their adolescent eight years, or maybe when they were single, that there was some reckless behavior in their opinion, it often can create shame. Can I give you a hint? Fellas, this might surprise you. And again, I'm saying this is a bit stereotypical, but I'm just telling you what I've learned a lot in my working with clients. A lot of times husbands will say to me, because not everybody was celibate before they got married. So husbands will say, I don't understand. Before we got married, she seemed way more free. And now that we're married, it's like she's become really timid. Sometimes that's because of shame. 
thinking back on behaviors that took place before they said I do, before a woman said I do. Many times with men, if there's been any abuse in their life, that will create a sense of shame. How we live out that shame may be different. A man might become way more promiscuous. A woman might become way more timid, or it could be the other way around. But shame can create a barrier to sexual freedom. And here's number three the stories we tell ourselves. Let me tell you a quick story really quickly. Um, I had a very, very good friend who was a first lady or is a first lady at a church. And I remember she told me, she said, yeah, I was talking to some older women um, when they were you know, mentoring me a little bit. And she said, they told me um, there are certain things that ladies just don't do in the bedroom. Well, if you're having that story in your head, maybe that's what your grandmother told you. Maybe that's what your mom told you. Maybe you heard stories about those girls who were fast or those dudes who were out there. Stories, the things we tell ourselves in our head can create a barrier to sexual freedom. And so I want you to, number one, identify, is there any sin that's creating a barrier for your sexual freedom? Number two, is there any shame? And then number three, are there some stories, some things in your mind that you're telling yourself that's creating a barrier? Another way these stories can show up is that if you think your spouse is comparing you to someone else, someone else, that's a story you could be telling yourself and it's stopping you from being sexually free. Maybe you think your spouse is looking for something, somebody who is uh, skinnier, somebody who is thicker, somebody who is stronger, and you're telling yourself a story. Those things can hinder your sexual freedom. Okay, so if you're just logging on, let me recap. We are talking about... Um, what are the barriers to sexual freedom? That's the three things I think every man and woman needs to know. Which of those three things could be hindering your sexual freedom? I talked about the fact that I don't understand why adults and people of faith are timid, don't want to talk about sex, or they go all the way too far and they're um, really uh, crude or crass about it. There should be a, a balance. And the reality is sex is a gift that God gave us. And there are three reasons why he created sex. For there to be a picture of oneness, number two, for us to procreate, and then number three, so that we can have pleasure. And so if we have a God that wants us to enjoy this gift, why aren't we? I just share with you the barriers to sexual freedom. I share with you the barriers to sexual freedom. Now I want to talk about the difference between want to sex and supposed to sex. Before I dive into that, remember, if you have any questions throughout this Facebook Live, post them here, and I will answer them as I go. Sometimes this conversation makes people a little hesitant to ask questions. So if that is you, just shoot me an email, contact at ibelieveinmarriage.com contact at ibelieveinmarriage.com and I'll try to get to it either directly to you or I'll get to it in another Facebook training. All right. All right. So I love this part of the conversation. What is the difference between want to sex and supposed to sex? I love this conversation because there is a difference. And I don't know about you, but I have experienced both. I have experienced want to sex and supposed to sex. And can I give a little bit of our business? Y'all know I tell our crazy so you don't have to tell yours. And I try to be discreet when I talk about this part of our lives. Uh, but I will say my husband has been very clear with me over these 16 years of marriage. Very clear. I don't have to second guess it. He does not hesitate. He lets me know very clearly. He does not like supposed to sex. He'll take it, but he does not like it. He wants want to sex. So let me tell you the difference. Want to sex and supposed to sex is different in that supposed to sex is I'm supposed to have sex with my man, so let me, boy, come on in here. Let's get this over with. We ain't had sex in how long? All right, come on. Let me go ahead and do this. A scandal is about to come on, so you better make it quick. That's supposed to sex. Want to sex is when you also desire it. You're looking forward to you into it. You're fully engaged in it. It is an intimate moment that you both are fully committed to. Want to sex is where that fire is popping. That want to sex is where the chemistry is off the chain. That want to sex is filled with passion. Supposed to sex. Another word for it is um, sex out of obligation. And I don't want your marriage to be made up of sex out of obligation. Now, you saw me use that um, analogy of the wife giving supposed to sex, but let's keep it real. And I want to be clear about this because often there's a stereotype that it is just the husband that wants sex and the wife doesn't want it. And that might be ca the case in some marriages, but in plenty of marriages, it's the opposite way. There are plenty of marriages where the wife is really, really wanting more intimacy and the husband doesn't have the libido. So one of the things I ask couples to do 
is I ask for the both of you to pray that your libido, that your sexual appetite is in unison. I want you to pray that your sexual appetite is in unison, that your husband doesn't want sex more than you, that you don't want sex more than your husband, that the both of you truly, truly want a quality sex life. Remember, I talked about the fact that married couples on average are having sex 64 times a year. Now, again, that might not be you and your spouse. If, you are, if you're taking care of business every day, go for it. You tell me how you're making that happen. But if you're having sex every day, that's no problem. This is not applying to you. But for those people who are saying, yeah, Robin, I mean, I don't know if it's quite 64. We might be at 74. We might be at 55. But the bottom line is this. Are you both satisfied with the quality and the quantity of your sex? That's the question I want you, the two of you, to, to discuss. Are you both satisfied with the quality and the quantity of your sex? So if you and your spouse are saying, look, with our lives, with all this going on, once a week is totally fine with us. No shame. It's just, it's just the issue. Are both of you okay with it? If you're okay with it and your spouse isn't, then it's not okay. The two of you have to come up with um, the number that will work for both of you and the quality of it. And this is a conversation you have to have. This is a conversation my husband and I had very clearly. We talked about it. We said, I asked him, what is the quality that would be great for you? What is the quantity that would be great for you? And that's why I said it's super important that adults aren't afraid of this conversation. All right. So I'm talking about want to sex versus supposed to sex. Want to sex is that sex that you both are fully engaged and supposed to sex. Another word for it is sex out of obligation. And I don't want um, men or women to have to deal with want to sex versus supposed to sex. All right. So I'm about to wrap up this conversation, but I want to share with the men directly and then I'm going to share with the women, and then we are going to wrap up. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them now, okay? So, fellas, do you want more of the want to sex versus the supposed to sex? Are you interested more in experiencing sex where your wife is fully invested and not the how much longer is this going to go sex? Okay, so I don't know you personally. I don't know your story personally. I'm not in your marriage, but I'm going to share with you some things, just four things, just four things on average or four things across the board that can help you get closer to want to sex. Now, as I share these four things, I would love for you to jot them down. And then I encourage you to go to your wife and say, hey, I just happened to stumble across this video. This lady was talking about want to sex versus opposed to sex. And she shared four things or any of these four things important to you, that will just launch the conversation. Maybe she'll say, I don't know who that chick was. None of those four things are important to me, but these things are. It doesn't matter. I'm okay with that. I just want the conversation to get started. Now, these four things doesn't mean it's going to wipe away all of your issues, but I can tell you this is going to get you on the right track. So here is the first thing. When a husband wants... Um, improved intimacy in her in his marriage this is what i want you to understand that your wife needs to be able to trust you okay she needs to be able to trust you and that trust goes so much deeper than just fidelity and that's trust on both ends ladies your husband needs to be able to trust you let me put a pin in it and share where i lost my husband's trust at one stage of our marriage i told you i tell our crazy so you don't have to tell yours there was a season early on in our marriage where I lost my husband's trust. The Bible says the heart of his husband's, the heart of her husband safely trusts her. And that trust is so much more than just fidelity. And one of the things that had happened over the time of our marriage is that when my husband would share things with me, share things that were bothering him, share things that were concerned with him, that he was concerned about, share things that were a burden for him, the way I would respond would be completely over the top. I see that my husband just joined the Facebook Live and I don't even need him to amen it because I already know. The way I would respond would be completely over the top. He would share something with me and it would be, oh my God, what are we going to do? Why would you do that? Why would you say that? I can't handle it. Oh my God. 
I mean, I would give him all of that. Even just then, me giving it to you wore you out. So you can imagine how it wore him out. And so what would happen is that I taught my husband inadvertently, unintentionally, I taught him not to come to me with things that were burdening him, things that were concerning him until he had it all worked out, until he had it all resolved. I taught him that by my response. So I had to be intentional about him being able to share his heart with me and me respond in a way that drew him closer to me and didn't push him away. So again, to my husband's trust is so much more than just fidelity. You might be a faithful man, but can your wife trust you with these four things? Number one, can she trust that you have her back, that you have her back? Can she trust that no matter what, there is nobody, there is no one, there is nothing that is going to take precedence over her? That includes your job, that includes your coworkers. I hate to throw this one out here. That includes your mama. That includes your child's mama, that includes your sisters, your brothers, your lying brothers. Does she know that you have her back, that she can depend on you, that um, let's say you're frustrated with her or let's say your mom is frustrated with her. You might think that your wife was wrong, but does your wife know that you'll never throw her under the bus with your mama? Now, you might come in the house and say, baby, you were tripping. Baby, you were out of line. But in front of your mama, you say, um, you know what, my me and me and my wife, we got it. We are, we cool. Does she know you have her back? It's a tough question, but you got to be able to answer it. And here's the deal, fellas. Hear me when I say this: just because you think you get an A on it, you may not get an A on it. Just because you think you got a check mark, she might be saying. And have you created a space that she can really tell you the truth? So that's number one. Number two, can she trust that you can carry? the weight. Fellas, one of the things, I have not met a woman who this is not true for. I have as many women I have worked with, and I work with all kinds of people. I work with people who are not even necessarily faith-based, but across the board, Black, white, Hispanic, across the board. I'm telling you, a wife wants to know that you can carry the weight. It doesn't mean that she's not going to take care of things. It doesn't mean that she's not going to work. It doesn't mean that she's not going to help the family. But every wife wants to know that she can take a deep breath. Every wife wants to know that you can carry the weight. Not that you're going to have to carry it all the time by yourself, but she wants to know if she needs to take a deep breath, if she needs to step back, if she needs to rest, if she needs to chill out, if it's just getting to be too much for her, she needs to know that you can carry the weight. She needs to know that she has somebody that's dependable, that she can look to, that she can turn to. Listen, so let me just give you this tidbit. So many women were raised in a matriarchal home. That's where the women took care of everything. Maybe the father was um, absent or maybe he was present and passive. But because of that, many women were raised in a, patri I mean, a matriarchal home, which means they saw their aunties running. My friends kill me because they tell me I say auntie, but I'm from Texas. So they saw their aunties running it. They saw their grandmamas running it. They saw their mamas running it. And so for them, the woman takes care of business. So then she gets married, especially if she marries a man of God who's saying, I'm the head of the household. Many times she's never seen it. She doesn't know what that looks like. And she's been taught to take care of business. And she should not be punished for that. You should be able to show her that you can carry the weight. Okay. Number one, she needs to know that you have her back. Number two, that you can carry the weight. And number three, that you respect her insight and wisdom. Again, we're talking about how do you get from want to supposed to sex to want to sex. I'm not telling you this is going to fix all of those issues, but I'm telling you this is going to get you on the right track. So number three, she needs to know that you respect her insight and wisdom. Listen, women want to know that you care about what they have to say. You care about their perspective, that you're not trying to run a, um, a, a monarchy, that you are not trying to um, dictate or to parent her. Women aren't looking for a father. They're looking for a partner. So she wants to know that she's heard in the marriage. So number one, that you have her back, that you can carry the weight, that you respect her insight and her wisdom. And then number four, she simply wants to know that she's your priority, that she the children, y'all's intimate family is her, is your priority. If she knows that you are considering her, that you're intentionally looking out for her, that you're making sure that she is covered and protected, 
I'm telling you, that's going to get you much closer to that want to sex. All right, so if you're just joining on, we are talking about sex. Y'all, every time I say let's talk about sex, I can't help it. The song is playing in my head. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. D does that happen to you too? All right, so we've talked a little bit about um, quantity versus quality in our sex life. We've talked about why God created sex. We've talked about the barriers to sex. We've talked about the fact that as grown people, we should be able to have this conversation in a way that's respectful and a way that still honors God. And respectful doesn't mean that we're boring, that we're not taking care of business in the bedroom. We just ain't got to tell you how we're taking care of business. But we want to make sure that we are intimately engaged in our sex life in a way that we are both satisfied. So I'm talking about how do we get away from supposed to sex and how do we get some more want to sex? <laughs> I just got tickled about something. The other day, my husband and I were talking and we were having a really, really long, in-depth conversation. I mean, he was really in tune. Like he was really, and I was really like, he is really interested in what I'm talking about. I mean, I was going on and on and I promise you, I probably talked for a good 30, 40 minutes, and he was asking questions. He was, I was like, all right. So then I said, all right, babe, I'm getting ready to go to bed. He said, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Not the way I just invested all this time. <laughs> and so we laughed and we joked about it because he's teasing me. He was teasing me. But the reality is we want to make sure that we are doing what one another needs to make sure that we move from, want, some, some, from supposed to sex to want to sex. Got all flustered there. All right, uh, ladies, it's your turn. I just finished talking to the fellas about how do you move from supposed to sex to want to sex. And ladies, listen, I don't know your situation. Stereotypically, a lot of times we have heard that it is the husband who wants so much sex and the wife is trying to run away from it. And that might not even be the case for you. I don't want to even project that. That may not be what's happening. But many times for us, we want more intimacy. Sex, we love it. We want it. But sex often for us, I remember whenever I teach this seminar, I often ask the husbands, define intimacy. Define intimacy. I wrote a book on this topic and I asked my husband as I was writing the book, honey, define intimacy for me. And he said, S E. X defines intimacy. Well, if you ask me to define intimacy, I'm going to talk about us talking, us connecting, us knowing what's going on with one another. And he said, mm -mm. intimacy for me is sex. And so ladies, if you relate to me, if you love sex and sex is amazing, but intimacy for you is him being engaged with you, doing what my husband did the other day, actually listening and asking questions and being involved. And then for that will open you up to have a greater desire for sex. I want to talk to you a little bit about what you can do to create that atmosphere in your home. All right. So do you want your husband to be more emotionally connected to you? Let me share with you four things you can do. Or actually, I'm going to come from the perspective of four things I want you to not to do. Okay. Number one, if it is the case in your marriage that your sexual appetite is not as great as your spouse's, if your spouse's sexual appetite is much more intensified than you, than you I want you to not criticize his sexual appetite. I don't want you to criticize his sexual appetite. I remember there was a season in my marriage, and that's what prompted me to write my book, Intentional Intimacy for Married Women. It's what prompted this. One day, my husband was, um, we had had this intense discussion because he was saying, babe, we're going to have to do better. I mean, our, our, the, qual the quantity of our sex life is slipping. We have got to do better. And it was around the time I'd had my second daughter, and my libido was just gone. I just didn't have a libido at all. And I remember I was driving down the street, and I was really complaining to myself. I was like, I'm sick of this. I mean, every time I look out, up, oh, this man's wanting to have sex. I'm tired of that. Like, I'm, ugh. And I was just complaining, and I felt the Holy Spirit say, you're mad because your husband wants to have sex and he wants to have sex with you. I felt like, oh my God, I got really convicted. Now listen, if I say that and it doesn't convict you, no worries. But if that resonated with you, I want you to hear me. Do not criticize your spouse's appetite. If you want him to be emotionally connected to you, I want you to stop that. Don't criticize the sexual appetite. Number two, I want you to make sure that you are not creating a non-safe environment. Let me tell you what I mean about that, because that sounds so extra, a non-safe environment. Let me tell you what I mean, ladies. And I'm going to do a Facebook Live on this. 
if I have one more woman sit on my couch, if I have one more woman on a coaching call, I do a lot of my coaching, uh, my virtual coaching like this via Skype or we do it over the phone. If I have one more woman tell me, Robin, hey, my husband just does not talk. He will not talk to me. And when I talk, start to suggest some of the reasons that the husband doesn't talk, they ain't feeling it. <laughs> the wives are not feeling it. They're like, Robin, mm -mm. But I want you to understand that most men tell me that when they are wanting to engage with their wife, when they do want to talk, they feel like they're always trying to avoid landmines. If I say this, she's going to go off. If I don't say this, she's going to get mad. If I go here, it's going to open up a whole can of worms. So if you want to connect emotionally with your spouse, I want you to be careful that you're not creating a non-safe environment. I want you to create an environment where he feels free to share. It doesn't mean that you're going to be rigid. It doesn't mean that the things he says may not upset you. And bring y'all come to see me. I'll help y'all deal with all of that. But the bottom line is you want to do your part that you're creating a safe environment. So number one, don't criticize his sexual appetite. Number two, don't create a non-safe environment. Here's number three. If you want your spouse to be, emo ladies, if you want your husband to be emotionally connected to you, I want you to be careful that you don't control, try to control him by withholding sex. I don't want you to try and control him by withholding sex. Let me try to give you this picture. Again, many times women tell me, I just want my husband to communicate. I mean, I just want him to talk to me. Okay, so imagine if your spouse, if maybe your husband does this, just imagine he gets upset and he just says, you know what, I'm just, I'm not into talking. Talking is just not my thing and I just prefer just to sit in the house and not say nothing. And that's his stance across the board. That's not okay. Well, if that's the case, I don't want your stance to be, I'm just not into sex. I just don't feel like sex. Sex is just not a big deal to me. I don't want that to be your stance either. So I don't want you to manipulate or to control him by withholding sex. Now, again, remember, I said some of this may not fit your relationship. So I want you to take these four things I'm telling you about your husband, and I want you to take it to him and say, again, this woman, Robin, was talking about sex. She said these four things. Are you concerned about these four? If he says absolutely not, then say, what are you concerned about? I want this to open up dialogue, okay? So here's number four. I don't want you to underestimate the importance of appeal. I don't want you to underestimate the importance of sexual appeal. So this is so corny, what I'm about to tell you. But again, I share my crazy so you don't have to share yours. When I think I'm looking super cute, when I've been gone all day and my husband hasn't seen me, I don't immediately come home and wrap my hair up. I try to wait to make sure that he can see me as good as everybody else is seeing me when I'm out, of, out and about. Men are visual. So if you want to create emotional con connection, I want you to make sure that you're not underestimating appeal. Listen, ladies, I don't know about you, but let me tell you a little bit about my life. I see clients all day, back to back, 9, 10, 11, 12, 1, 2. I see clients all day, back to back. Then we have three young kids, three under 10. Then we have a big, huge, we have a big, huge demand on our time. We have, I have my business. My husband has his contract business. Then we just launched a church. I'm sharing all of this is because there's so many things pulling at our attention. If I'm not careful, as soon as I get home, I'll be wrapping up my hair, putting on I wish I could show you this robe that I wear that my husband just does not like. I'll throw this robe on and I'm not being intentional about appeal. So I don't want you to underestimate the power of appeal. Okay, so let's recap everything we've talked about. First, we talked about the, the reality is that God created sex. He gave us sex as a gift. There is a difference between want to sex and supposed to sex. And if you want more of the want to sex, there are four things men need to do. There are four things women need to do. We also talked about the barriers to sexual intimacy. Every man needs to know these barriers. Every wife needs to know these barriers. And then we also talked about why God created sex. There are three reasons why he created sex, and we went over those. All right, guys, if this helped you, I want you to share this on your Facebook wall. Again, say this is must watch Facebook. Before we go, you know I gotta talk about it one more time. On April 14th, I am hosting an in-person event. Listen, everybody needs a coach. Let me tell you, LeBron, Beyonce, Oprah, 
Obama, all of them have something in common. They all have a coach. They all had somebody that helped to guide them along the way. I would love to be your coach. I would love for you to join me and my husband on April 14th for the Couples Coffee and Conversation Live event. Right now, early bird registration is taking place. Head right on over to ibelieveinmarriage.com slash winning team. On April 14th, I'm going to help you and your spouse build your marriage as a winning team. There are habits of winning teams. There are habits of losing teams. And I want you to know what you and your spouse need to do to win and what y'all need to do to make sure you stop losing if that's the case, all right? So I wanna help you. Visit ibelieveinmarriage.com slash winning team to register today. I'll see you guys later. Take care.